Madam Commissioners, is number 13, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, docket number 16-2658, block 1387, lot 25, 39 East 72nd Street, also known as 39A East 72nd Street in the Upper East Side Historic District, a row house with neo greek style elements designed by Robert B. Lind and built in 1881 to 82, and subsequently altered in 1905 by William Strom. The application is to alter the facade and area way and to construct a rooftop addition. Good afternoon, commissioners, Olivia Brzee, preservation staff, the item is 39 East 72nd Street. And the application is to alter the, the facade and area way and construct a rooftop addition. The project site is located on the north side of East 72nd Street between Park and Madison Avenues within the Upper East Side of Stark District. And the subject property uh, shown here is uh, one of two, two remaining buildings in what was originally a row of nine neo greek style buildings. Um, Cass Steckelberg of Higgins and Faith Park will present the detailed proposal. Thank you, Olivia. We'll reopen the hearing. Whoops. Cass Steckelberg of Higgins Faith Park and Partners here with uh, our team, uh, including uh, Daniel Minkwitz from Mink Development, our client, and John Setra of Setra Ready Architects will actually uh, give you the, uh, the design proposal. Um, but in, in, in way of uh, background, I wanted to sort of introduce the project and sort of give you the, the context and, and, and talk a bit about our approach as we, um, as we uh, began this, uh, this process. As Olivia said, the project addresses 3090 72nd Street, located on the north side of 72nd, across town, wide across town street between Madison and Park Avenue. Uh, this is a photo of the existing building. Uh, this is a rendering uh, of the proposed work. Um, the existing building um, is called out in the designation report as, as its original style neo grec as its present style some neo grec details. And primarily, as it notes in the designation report entry, primarily it's the cornice um, that remains. And this is one of an original row of nine row houses. This is the westernmost of that row. Um, the only other uh, in the row that remains is 41 East 72nd Street, which shares um, an identical cornice. And so when we began the project, um, obviously we knew that that cornice needed to be preserved. Um, in addition to, uh, to that, the only other historic material uh, at the building is this fence uh, down at the base and a wrought iron and glass doors at the entry. This fence dates to uh, an alteration of the building in 1905, which involved the removal of the stoop, the creation of an areaway, and in the rear, actually, the construction of a six-story um, rear yard extension. Um, so uh, the building obviously has largely lost its integrity. It still has some remaining historic uh, materials. And, and so it was largely that cornice which sort of guided us a bit in how we approached this. We didn't think that a very bold contemporary new row house facade was the right approach for this project in large part because we had this fabulous neo grec um, cornice that related to the building next door. And so what our, our, our efforts were really were to integrate this building back into its, its remaining uh, row mate and also to, um, to do it in a sort of historical, uh, historical way. Um, we looked at other buildings in the district, uh, looked at the other neo grec buildings, how those other buildings grew over time, particularly with the um, introduction of mansard additions um, and other modifications, and we'll talk a bit about that um, as we go through the presentation. Um, the rendering on the right um, is a, uh, a representation of our proposal. Um, the color is a bit off. We are proposing on the front facade um, to rebuild the, the front in a true sandstone. We have a material sample. It's very difficult to render um, sandstone in, um, in, 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 in a rendering. Um, but the proposal involves uh, a few things that I want to just call it. It's the, the restoration and preservation, obviously, of the cornice, the salvage and reuse of this uh, very handsome uh, 1905 railing and the wrought iron and glass uh, front doors to the building. It involves reconstructing the front facade in sandstone, uh, integrating both neo grec and more classical detailing, and as I said, in a, in a true stone material. Um, and then constructing a one-story addition of the mansard fronted roof, which is something that one, as you see, one sees throughout the historic district. And in addition, there is a setback uh, penthouse that's built uh, above that, uh, that mansard floor. Um, it's set back 32 and 37 feet, you'll see this in the design, 32 and 37 <coughs> feet from the front facade. And it's clad in a standing seam copper, and it reads uh, perhaps largely like a, like a bulkhead on the roof. 
So that's sort of a summary of both our, our approach and how we, how we uh, entered into the design process and what, what our proposal um, is. Um, a few existing condition photographs. Again, the building was stripped um, nearly 50, more than 50 years ago, sometime between the 1940s and 1950. Um, and so all that you have is this uh, painted, uh, painted facade with the original cornice. Um, this photo here in the top middle, you can see the relationship, obviously, um, that binds these two buildings together largely through the, through the cornice, but also the, the position of the window openings, although the loss of the enframements at 39 sort of alters that, uh, that relationship. Um, the facade, uh, we did a few probes, and the facade has been coated, uh, the brownstone has been coated with what appears to be sort of a thin cementitious coating and then painted. Um, and, um, and you can see sort of the, the remains of some of the, the detailing at the lower floors. Um, the areaway uh, at the base of the building, this uh, wrought iron gate, and then uh, the wrought iron and glass uh, doors at the main entry, which are set about four or five steps off the sidewalk. Um, some photographs on the roof. Um, this is sort of relevant in the overall context. This is a view looking back towards 72nd Street. So here's 72nd. Here's the back of the building. We're here looking forward. Um, you can see skylights and a one-story addition uh, on the building to the east, uh, 41 East 72nd Street. And then here, there's a large um, uh, elevator machine room bulkhead set back um, on the roof of the bank building um, adjacent uh, to the west. Um, this is uh, the sixth floor. So the building already has a sixth floor. It's the sixth floor of the rear yard extension. This is what was constructed in 1905, um, added to the back of the original 1880s row house. And then another view looking east at the, uh, at the extension, the rooftop extension on the building to the, uh, to the east at 41 East 72nd Street. Um, again, the building in context, here we are at 39 East 72nd Street and it's remaining uh, row mate at 41. Um, this building, a cross and cross bank building completed in 1932, uh, took the place of two uh, other rows, uh, row houses that were not part of the row but certainly spoke to the scale of that, and then a 1960 um, apartment building which took the place of four or five other buildings uh, in the original row. Obviously the context on 72nd Street has changed significantly from the 1880s when, when 3090 72nd Street was first constructed. Um, looking at, um, at historical photographs, this, is, this building right here is 3090 72nd, and you can see other than the construction of this uh, apartment building which is completed in 1916-1917, the entire block front on the north side of 72nd Street uh, was composed of uh, brownstone fronted row houses, which is pretty typical for almost all of the, the streets uh, on the Upper East Side, uh, primarily speculative built brownstone fronted row houses. Um, this photo in 1950 uh, begins to show sort of the change in context, not just in the row, but, but also in the immediate uh, vicinity. Um, so first looking at, at 39, so by 1950 the facade had been stripped and you can see the remaining buildings in the row have all sort of been altered in some way or another. They're, they're still sort of unified in terms of their scale, um, but they have differing um, cornice heights um, and obviously different facade treatments, but there still is some unity to, uh, to that group. And then this building here, as I said, the bank building, uh, which took the place of these two, these two row houses on the western end. Um, and just to point out too, obviously the construction of large scale apartment buildings um, fronting onto Park Avenue, which happened after the electrification uh, of, a, of a rail line on Park Avenue. So 72nd Street, um, like much of the district, um, changed quite a bit in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and it is this sort of evolving, um, this evolving context, um, both within the sort of immediate row and its larger, uh, larger context that I think is most visible in these photographs. Um, returning back to 3090 72nd Street, the tax photo from 1940, this is 39 here. So the, the original brownstone fronted facade remained in 1914, you can, uh, excuse me, in 1940. You can see the areaway fence here and then the adjacent, uh, the adjacent buildings. This is 41 East 72nd, which remains today. This uh, ribbon window um, actually had been cut into the facade and has since been restored back to its uh, original condition. Uh, the 1980, uh, circa 1980 photograph from your own collection from the time of designation, uh, looking fairly as it does today, a, a sort of through wall air conditioning um, grill here, two tone paint on the front facade, um, and then the 1980 uh, tax photo on the right. What, where do you think the original entry was on the building from the, by here obviously the, it had been removed. Right. Um, I believe it was here. 
Uh, I'm not sorry, do we know from the stair? The stair was there. on that side. It is on this side. Okay. There's an L, I think, um, yeah, so it, we believe it was to the, uh, to the left. Thanks. Um, and uh, even in that early, earlier photo, the 1917 photo, it had been removed as well. Right. Um, so as I said, in, in sort of approaching this project, um, we wanted to look at the way buildings of this nature sort of evolved over time, particularly neo grec row houses, seen um, in, in great numbers throughout the historic district. We have a series of examples to, to look at. This is a selection. There are many other examples that we could have included, but these seem to sort of illustrate our point most clearly. And what, what this sort of first set of images uh, illustrates is that these buildings, originally built as speculative row houses, changed significantly, particularly in the first decade of the 20th century, and, and there are a number of reasons why that happened. Obviously, aesthetic uh, preferences, uh, private ownership versus sort of speculative construction. People wanted to sort of personalize their, their own homes. Uh, perhaps street widenings, which uh, required the removal of stoops. But these two buildings, uh, these two were built together as a row of two in 1882, the same year as 3090 72nd Street. And these buildings changed in the first decade, both um, at, at the base uh, of both of these buildings, under different architects, and obviously done differently. Um, but you still get a sense of sort of the connection between the two because of the openings of the upper floors and the cornice. But what you see is this sort of two-story expression with a cornice that runs across below the third floor here, the introduction of ironwork below these windows, uh, and then the re, sort of recladding, removal of the stoop and reconstruction of the, uh, of the ground floor. You can see it perhaps more clearly here. This sort of done in a, in a classical manner with the, uh, the columns and a sort of trabeated uh, entry. Uh, this building, which has a, a third floor, which is, uh, has been altered, has this sort of pair of cornices and, and the introduction of ironwork. Um, what you end up with these, with these buildings is sort of a mix of architectural styles. You have the original neo grec on, particularly on the upper floors, and then typically sort of more of a classical treatment at the lower floors that's consistent with changes in the first decade of, of the 20th century. Um, other changes um, occurred, this is, a, this is actually one of a row of 10 row houses. This is the only one in the row that maintains the plane of its uh, original upper floors. These on the other side were reconstructed and pushed out. But this one was interesting um, for the retention of these upper three floors in the original cornice. And again, this sort of classicizing treatment at the base um, with these uh, ionic columns uh, and the centering uh, of the entry above this uh, slight uh, shallow balcony. Um, so varying treatments, varying styles um, integrated into one facade. Uh, we also saw, as we walked the district, the integration of mansard roofs as a means of sort of growing up these buildings. So original, original construction, a unified row, and as these buildings took on new ownership and people had um, different requirements and desires these buildings grew and the way often it was done was the introduction of a full floor with a mansard roof. So this building here, uh, 40 East 75th Street, again the upper three floors have their original neo grec detailing and in 1910 the base was altered uh, and a mansard roof was, was added at the top. Um, similarly, uh, this Italian aid row house a little bit earlier from the 1870s on East 71st Street, um, here it's this uh, white front of building, uh, the base was altered and a uh, uh, copper clad dormers and mansard roof was constructed. You can see sort of brick, uh, brick parapet and stone coping on the side. Uh, this row in particular, this is four of an original row of 15. Um, while there's a great variety on this, on this group of four, you still read this as a sort of unified, a unified row. And this row has actually been through quite a bit. Right now there's sort of four different colors across the facades. Um, this building originally, uh, sorry, not originally, at the, at the time of designation, that's when my clock starts ticking originally, it was a no-style building, um, and under commission review, the facade was restored, and uh, a large mansard addition was, was constructed up at the top. I think there's still, because of the position of the windows, there's still this sort of reading of this group uh, as a row. Interestingly, this building here, uh, 125 East um, 62nd Street, um, I'm sorry, it's 127 East 62nd Street. This building had a brownstone facade originally from the 1870s, but its facade in 1917 was actually reconstructed in sandstone. So what this is is actually a lighter colored stand, sandstone, and it shares some similarity in the detailing of the window and framings, but it still very much feels like it's part of the row. But we found that particularly interesting that within this row there were even some buildings that had reclad re, re facades in a, in a different type of sandstone. Um, as well, mansard uh, additions or mansard roofs existed with uh, purpose-built 
uh, construction of this 1870 uh, building on Madison Avenue, an original Mansard from the 1870s. This building uh, on East 69th Street from 1910 that has a Mansard that was part of this reconstruction at that time from the original um, 1870s row house. And then another example of an added uh, Mansard, hard to see through the trees here. Um, but this is to say that in sort of considering the uh, enlargement, which was a necessity to sort of fulfill the program of this project, and considering the enlargement, we, we wanted to do this in, in as an appropriate manner as we could. So we felt this is a change that occurred historically, seen throughout the district, and so we've integrated that into sort of a historical design for the new facade. We've done the facade in sandstone, which is a true material, true stone material, uh, and integrating a historic uh, element uh, as a means of, of uh, growing, uh, growing the building. Do you have a question? How many mansards did you see with additions on top of that? Uh, it's hard to see because we were looking from the street. Um, I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, and we have an addition um, on the top of ours, um, which you'll see. Uh, it's, its visibility is limited, and it's set more than 30 feet back. Um, and uh, we'll take you uh, through the visibility studies and the design of that. I have, I have just a question, if I could. Yes. Um, so you've, you've noted that really the only historic piece is this cornice. Uh, but actually, the facade it, and the proportions of the windows are historic, whether you take it all the way back or you take it to your starting point, which is designation. Do you want to go to that elevation? And so you've managed to not say that you changed the elevation by inserting another floor in order to make it ground level entry. Think, right, so, and John will speak to this. I think one of the considerations that we had to accommodate was accessibility. Um, there isn't really room for a ramp in the areaway. So we did want to bring the entry up to grade. And that, has, that affected the lower, particularly the lower two floors. And as, as I showed you in, in some of these other um, examples here, particularly, the lower two floors were all, often sort of reworked um, in a different manner, in a different style than the upper floors. And so that's sort of how we, we saw this sort of fitting in that, um, in that framework. Um, so the base of the building in particular is changed and the heights of the floors for sure are modified, but it's really to accommodate in that great entry. Um, and so we'll... Um but the windows above that are, uh, are those uh, of the historic shape and the, size? The historic proportion there, there uh, on a, John will take you through the details, no, okay. of this, but there are some very slight variations. Okay. Um, yes. I'm John Setcher, the architect working uh, on this project. And so I'll continue um, going through. Not to advance. Looks like it's going backwards. Four. Five. Five. Okay, okay great. Okay. I, mean, this, I just want to say the study that we did of how to enlarge or to add on to this building, uh, we, we, we did spend that time looking in the district because we wanted to do something, we wanted to address this problem in a contextual way and to find uh, solutions. And many times this is the way we approach uh, design problems, in, especially in a historic district, is look to see how these problems were, were resolved uh, previously. And, the idea of a, of a, uh, a mansard uh, roof addition was something that seemed to fit in you know, quite easily into, into the context and the richness of, uh, of these buildings. So uh, the, this, is, uh, this is showing the existing context uh, from Madison Avenue uh, to Park Avenue, a little bit farther to the, to the east and to the west. And uh, you can see that the context is quite, is developed, it's quite a, uh, a mixture of uh, uh, buildings in terms of their uh, their bulk uh, and style. Uh, there's been there have been quite quite a lot um, that has happened since this original. All of these buildings here uh, actually were occupied originally by these uh, by these brownstones. So the uh, so the work that we're proposing uh, doesn't change that line necessarily the cornice line. But you know, to your point before about the patterning of the windows, I think that, is, that was an important element in terms of how to, 
you know, how to address uh, the work that we were proposing here. But there was, there's been some interesting, uh, I think, design changes that also have occurred uh, through the district. For instance, the bank building, where there was, where there, where, uh, there was a, a centering that was created by that, uh, by that structure in terms of its entrance. Uh, the articulation expression of a, uh, a trim line here uh, at the second floor was very, was very uh, um, I think it's an important part of that design. Uh, the stair uh, on our uh, neighbor's building to the east clearly creates a, a, a higher element in here. And even this, uh, this apartment building from uh, the 1960s picked up on the idea of some expression of the base and the building, which was kind of uh, also into these other buildings from earlier periods. So uh, there, there is some thinking in terms of how uh, all of this context kind of came together, I think, uh, over the years. Uh, so here you can see um, uh, what I was talking about with the, with the bank building and uh, uh, 41 East 72nd Street and the apartment building here. So one of the, one of the problems that we also were, had to address was accessibility into the building. Uh, the program calls for uh, the redesign and construction on the interior of three uh, duplex and triplex apartments. We wanted to eliminate this, uh, this step down here and pull up the entrance up to, uh, literally up to the sidewalk level there. So that uh, necess necessitated the uh, adjustment of the floor heights on the ground floor, which is now about three feet below uh, the sidewalk level, and the first and the parlor floor, which is about six feet uh, currently uh, above the sidewalk level. So in doing so, you see the, the greatest amount of change in terms of the patterning of the windows. Uh, the, the adjacent structure has some detailing and a water table here below the window lines. We were, our proposal was to move that line up to give our entrance uh, some expression and, and importance by uh, creating a, a cornice that goes across the top that's held by uh, two round columns and to also address the, the, that higher line that we see in the, in the street uh, by creating another cornice line here, a slight projection at that level. And then above that, uh, kind of a regularization of the window so that at this level, there is a very, very close match with the, uh, uh, with these, with the size of the windows. The placement of the windows is not changing. That's essentially what was there before. And as you'll see in some details, uh, we are introducing again the enframement that, um, uh, that, was, or that had originally been there, but actually with a slight modification uh, stylistically. The sill on the top floor is higher than the neighbor? Slightly, yes. That's because it exists that way now? Uh, it's, no, actually we're raising this a little bit to, uh, because we are adjusting some of the floors. Uh, you'll see in the section, um, what we're, we're Oh, here, here's the section. This is showing the uh, existing section of the building uh, where you see stepping down uh, to the ground floor uh, and a high parlor floor, which is just about uh, 15 feet uh, for the floor height here, and uh, 13, 11, 11, 6, and, and 11, 9. And the uh, inclusion of the, uh, uh, the upper uh, rear here, uh, sixth floor, fifth floor, sorry. Uh, the, uh, it's a, uh, this is a question because you're talking about the floors. Uh, yes. Can you go back to the earlier? So right now, I understand you want to adjust. What, I'm sorry. So what do you do? You're making the basement ceiling higher. Is that we're, correct? We're elevating this floor here. We're bringing this floor, the basement level, up to grade. Mm -hmm which then necessitates changing the first floor level and pushing that up, Re elevating that, it's reducing uh, the 14 foot 11 dimension there. If you look at- Right, but couldn't you, I'm just wondering if there's a way that instead of doing so much intervention that you raise the first floor so you can bring more light maybe into the basement, they, it still would be at its own level because you can take advantage of the 14 feet and then the next three floors, you can retain the, its, its historic dimensions. Mm -hmm. Because what you're doing is, what's happening at the lower level is now changing everything in the entire building. So 
Uh, I'm trying to see if there's a way where you can just restrict those changes within the first two floors and not affect uh, every floor above. <clears throat> well, it could, it, it's, possible, uh, it's possible to do that. I mean, you can see here, uh, what we tried to do was to create uh, an adequate height here. So I think that was, you know, then that necessitated that uh, elevation and that raising. Uh, but it also gave us an opportunity to slightly adjust these floors too. And we can look at that and see if that, uh, if it really works. I mean, because the, the only window that has really changed in terms of the, of the sill height, as you saw, was this, uh, uh, was the window here on the fifth floor. The others are, you know, very, very uh, close, well, almost ma actually matching here. Uh, and for instance, the, um, the lintel uh, condition here is the same. Here we kept that uh, line as well. So there is a, there is a change here. Uh, but here there is also a continuation that runs through. I mean, so there is a, I don't think we could propose, we could, you know, preserve that height in here. That would not, that would not work with raising the ground floor. Right, right. it wouldn't. But could you, you, you want, you, you didn't, the, the presentation wasn't started at, with the premise that you want to enter off of the ground, street ground, into your building. Is that the, the most important thing here? Well, yes, I think that does, yes, that does create the... And, and, and you don't want to go down, that's clear, but that's do you right. also not want to go up, as in the building next door? Um, no, that would require still, it doesn't solve our problem, which is the accessibility to the building for uh, people with physical disabilities. So, you, okay. you know, you, we're, the way that this is, uh, our proposal is that you literally can come right in, there's an elevator at that level, and you can, you can access all floors uh, from that point. Okay, and some of these other buildings, they don't have elevators, right? So this is, okay. And this building does have an elevator, however, it's just about as big as a, you know, old-fashioned phone booth. So it's, it's not, uh, it's not appropriate. Okay. Uh, okay, so actually one other thing here just to point out was the, uh, the location of the, um, of the mansard and uh, the inclusion of the windows that will penetrate that. You can see here that this is the existing cornice line, which is being preserved. Uh, we've studied this, and when we had our first meeting at, uh, at the community board, uh, some issues were raised about how close that was. We took a look at that. Uh, we slightly adjusted it since then to uh, move it back about a foot and a half, and also uh, reduce the height of the parapet here and set a, a glass parapet back so that it, it, it somewhat reduced the, the visibility and the, um, of, the, of the sloping uh, uh, mansard uh, element. And then you can see here uh, this mezzanine level, which is uh, from the building face here, is set back <coughs> 37 feet. And there is a portion here by the, where the uh, stairwell is, which is 32 feet. So you can see that on the, on the plans. So here is the, just a, a little bit more detail uh, for the entrance condition and also the, the, uh, uh, the gate that currently exists on the site here. The entrance is located on the west side of the property. So our proposal is to create one entrance because there are actually two. There was a, a service uh, uh, access here which went into, provided access into a, uh, a ground floor uh, art gallery. Uh, that existed on that level. So our proposal is to uh, reshift that or shift that over to the center, as you can see here in the elevation, and then using the same elements of the, of the cast iron gate, uh, create uh, a new gate or basically just a, re a new position uh, for the existing gate. Uh, in the rear, uh, of the building, you can see the uh, existing uh, pattern of windows. This was the part that was built in, I think you said, 19, 1905. Uh, and so we are proposing to reconfigure the windows uh, in that area there. And you can see here the, uh, where this is a side elevation of our, uh, of our mansard uh, here with, uh, with stone uh, uh, pieces along that, that will trim uh, the outer edge of it. 
some views from the rear uh, of the buildings. And actually, one other thing I should point out is that uh, we, we would like to also cut an area, um, a light well here in the back. We have a slight uh, a side yard here. So we'd like to cut out that uh, area to create the, some, uh, bring some natural light down into the, uh, into the cellar level. So that would occur, uh, that cut would occur uh, in this area here. This is, our, this is the neighbor to the east, and the, uh, this, this fencing uh, would not be disturbed. <clears throat> uh, here again, uh, details then at the top uh, for, the, for the new mansard. Uh, the three windows are uh, matching in, in width, uh, the windows from below. They're sitting back, and we, we propose to create a small uh, uh, well here so that we can get more light into that floor. And uh, as I said, there'd be a minimal uh, uh, parapet height here with a glass railing that would be set back another uh, 30 inches there. This is showing the condition uh, that we propose for the uh, sloping uh, masonry wall, which is partially exposed here. And you'll see that uh, in, those, in the street study views. The windows were, as you saw, are totally have been totally stripped of all of their ornamentation. Uh, so we would propose to add a, a projecting a, a, a sill with brackets below that, and uh, pilasters on the side, which uh, are similar in width to to our neighbor's building. But our neighbor's building, which has uh, a lot of intricate. Uh, uh, Grecian uh, carvings into it, uh, so somewhat like hieroglyphics. We propose to do something in a little bit uh, simpler uh, language. And this is how it all sort of comes together. And the stone uh, that we're proposing to use, as a sample of it here, is uh, this uh, sandstone, which is lighter in color than the dark brown stone that currently exists on the side. And uh, so here we have a number of studies. There is a on-site, uh, there is a mock-up, full-size mock-up that was constructed, which has uh, construction uh, safety netting around it. So you can see how it compares to uh, the existing condition with nothing and with how the building will look in, from various uh, positions. This is directly across the street from the site, so there's uh, some visibility of uh, the mansard. From that point, and then as you move as you move uh, west on the south side of Seventy uh, Second Street, uh, what begins to uh, open up in the view is the side wall, which is a, which will be treated with a standard masonry, which you can see an example of that here. Uh, and this is uh, this is the mock-up uh, that shows the uh, similar condition there, and uh, with nothing on top. Then as you get, as you get uh, um, to the west side of Madison Avenue, if you're standing on the west side of the street, uh, this is the area where there's the most exposure for, and this is the only area really. It's about, I think, about 100 feet. You know, so if you're you know, walking along you know, at a normal pace, it's a very short window where there is any, any, uh, any visibility. And, and uh, so you can see the mock-up here, you know, which shows the uh, the sixth floor and the mezzanine level above that. Uh, and here, this is, this is how it looks in, in the rendered version. And the wall that you're seeing back here is 37 feet back from this, from this plane, plane of the uh, existing building. And it's, a, it's about three or four feet uh, north, uh, south of the, uh, of the bulkhead over the, that exists over the, uh, the, bank, the bank building. Uh, and how? Uh, sorry. And how tall is it? Uh, the overall. You mean? Yeah, overall the overall height. height. So to the mansard, how tall is that? And then the additional mezzanine. It's about twelve feet. Twelve feet? No, t from the height that is there currently. Oh, from here? Yes. Uh, it's about. Uh, sorry, I don't want to guess. So if I could just bear with me for a minute, oh, okay. I can go back to uh, to the building section. So from the from the cornice, uh, this is this is uh, 11 foot 11 foot six to here, and this is about so it's another about 12 18 feet. feet. 
18 overall. No, it's 12 feet, 20. 6 no, the plus... 12, the 12 feet is for the roof, it's to the roof. This is actually higher. That's the line of the cornice there. That's the top of the cornice. Yeah. The 12 foot 6 is measuring from... Oh, the, I see. From okay, so... Right. So it's about, it's about 18, 18 feet from the cornice to the very top of this point here. Okay, it's 19 feet above the cornice. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, questions for the applicant? Yes. Um, yes, did, Roberta? So, so you were just saying what the height was. I was trying to figure out what would it take to not see the, the man side from there. Because you have the man side, which is what you see, right? That's that little right. piece that sticks yeah. up. You don't see the addition on top of that level, right? Well, I think it depends. As I said, it yeah, depends I mean, upon I mean, where you're, front, where you're, where you're looking. Because I mean, and this this diagram it. here shows the uh, literal uh, the distances from various places where you can see the mansard here, and there's a uh, hundred feet along uh, Madison and about sixty feet uh, along Seventy Second Street that you can that you can see something. If, if you look. If you, this is the this is where you can see the most of it. So uh, you know. So this. I mean, th th that's a part of the issue. Is there's if, always visibility. You know. So how do you address the visibility issue? You know. Right. I mean, so, not always, <laughs> but yeah, well, yes. but I think because the, uh, here the the building next to it is is small, mm -hmm. and. I'm not sure what happens on the other side because the adjoining building on the other side is also short. So you haven't taken any views from that? No, the building on the other side is a tall apartment building and it's not There's a visible. small, is, but okay, so you can't yeah. see anything no. from uh, the angle that from the, the immediate, right, right, the immediate building is actually short like this, it's the companion yeah, well, building. Yes, it's that, yes, right, it's this uh, our yeah. neighboring building, yes, that's true. But from here, the, the middle looks more natural than the, from this right. side angle, that looks more natural than the other part of the Right, and I think the visible, you know, having a visible mansard yes, may be I mean, fine yes. because they've right. actually shown yeah. some examples. I think yeah. it's no, the... It is, it's just that it, I was looking at it next in terms of height because we, right. you know, the, the thing about the cornices are all the same, so it looks, looks odd to have that, but it looks more natural to have that than to have the... The piece behind, the right? Piece on top. Just, just one more question. Um, so currently it's a single use, single residence? No, actually it's currently uh, I, I didn't seven hear that part. apartments. Seven apartments. And um, you're converting it to what, 11 apartments? Three apartments. Three apartments. Three apartments. Three apartments. Three apartments. Three apartments. There are plans if, you're, if you want to. No, I saw the plans. I just wasn't sure how many units there were. Yeah, so these are the uh, these are the plans above the existing cellar, uh, the ground floor. Uh, I'm sorry, existing cellar here with the elevator <coughs> access and the uh, the cutout that I was the light while I was referring to uh, in the rear. Uh, this is the so at the at the ground floor level, if you enter, uh, there's a small uh, lobby area here. Uh, the elevator is directly behind that. One of the apartments has an access to this level at grade, and uh, it has a number of bedrooms on this, on this level. Uh, the next floor uh, is a part of that unit, so you would come up to a, a stair or an elevator, and in in the, uh, the elevator serves all floors. This is the, a new fire stair that's being constructed. And uh, the front rooms retain, actually, their kind of original proportion of the a parlor, a parlor a suite. And in the rear, uh, the, this, this cut in the, uh, in the building allows us to create uh, a dining room here and a large eating kitchen on that level. This apartment is a uh, triplex unit, and so then it goes up. So the next level here is again uh, similar. So there's always uh, a large eating kitchen in the rear, a room here, and a large parlor uh, room in the front. And then sometimes there are 
uh, dining rooms. Can you go to the uh, top floors where you have the mezzanine? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so that apartment is, is, is made up of uh, this floor. This is, the, uh, this is the room that's created by the, uh, by the mansard. Those are the windows there. Uh, the stair, also it goes down to bedroom level, and then here it goes up to this floor here. That stair will take you up into uh, a room in the back, which is proposed to be a master bedroom, and then in the front, a large terrace. And this is what we were talking about before, where this is set back 32 feet and an additional five feet here is 37 feet. So this, is, this floor is literally uh, less than a third of the uh, typical floor. That's what you're saying. That's what we're yeah. saying. Right. And I think right. uh, uh, the commissioner's question was about, like, if you had to, you set that back further, the visibility reduces. Well, yes. The, but the stair, uh, the, the part that you're seeing the most is this area here. Uh, the elevator uh, is in, I think, the best position, uh, so we wouldn't want to move that, although it doesn't stop here, so it doesn't continue up. It stops uh, there. It doesn't. You does don't not have a stop on this level. No. The so then, which level does it stop at? The floor below. Okay. So in fact, there's no bulkhead on top yes, of this. Okay. Right. Well, the only the only the bulkhead, is. It's, okay. it's just the the staircase that you're seeing. Actually, if I go back to this view again, I think you can see uh, that uh, there are. You see two windows there. That one is at the top of the stair when you come from the unit below. The next window that you see a little corner there is actually in the, in the elevator shaft. So it doesn't come up. There's no additional height on the bulkhead. That's just. That's and it. so what am I seeing? There's some other things that's above that. Well, these are, stair these are oh. uh, mechanical Those are the stair bulk. Oh. No, these gray Allen boxes here, those are mechanical units. Air conditioning, uh, ventilation fans, exhaust fans. And to the right of that is a brown angle uh, thing that is the stair bulkhead. That's a, that's a bulkhead, right, to go up to couldn't, that roof level from the stair. Couldn't you just at least try and set that back so it could match with, there's an adjacent this, bulkhead, yes. Yeah, that's couldn't, what I was saying. This is currently, this is about three and a half feet uh, south of that, of that chimney there. That, uh, yeah, I mean, it's possible we could, we could look at that. Well, I think, uh, I don't know about others, but it's just, it seems very visible and, and unusual. I think we haven't seen that, um, that form of enlargement in the district. Um, but before we go to discussion, let me see, are there any other questions? And then we'll take public testimony, because I know there are a lot of people here to speak. Yes, Michael? It's floor ceiling height inside the mezzanine. Uh, it's, I think it's 10 feet of hard. It's a little lower than that. Mezzanine. Mm -hmm. And the mezzanine, looks like, oh. isn't it 11 feet? Uh, that's to the top. This is oh, about okay. 10 feet. The clear inside. feet. Yeah, okay, clear. Feet. All right, any other questions? Okay, why don't we take uh, testimony? Charles Mott? Um, I'm the president of 36 uh, East 72, which is right across the street from um, 39, and, and we are uh, opposed to this application uh, for the reasons that are listed in, in the resolution of community, of community board uh, eight. And I must say that the uh, idea that the Mansard is, is not visible, when you live right across the street, uh, it's, it's very visible. And, and uh, you can, we can see that with the mock-up that's, that's been put up there. Uh, Occasionally, and, and uh, we have have worked uh, from time to time to try to preserve the architectural um, history of, of the street and uh, the block, and, and I, I think so far so good. But I, I, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, you know this is a bit of a, a, a pretty outside outside change, and, and we're opposed to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Hall. Michael Hall, Friends of the Upper East Side. Um, it is clear that the applicant has done a great deal of research in developing this proposal, and Friends always appreciates an informed design. While the direction the applicant is moving is generally an improvement over the existing conditions, many of the aspects of the proposal are inappropriate. 
We welcome the return of the neo grec detailing in the window and door surrounds. However, rather than picking and choosing arbitrary examples from around the neighborhood, the applicant should look to the 1940s tax photo as a guide for restoration. It is for this reason that our committee found the iron balcony at the second floor to be totally inappropriate. In addition, we found the areaway fence to be slightly aggressive, though the applicant's reuse of the existing materials is commendable. Although we understand the desire to alter the floor plates and regularize the interior ceiling heights, this should not come at the expense of symmetry with the building's former twin at 41 East 72nd Street. It is perhaps understandable to change the first two floors, as this is common in the district, but the sill heights on the third, fourth, and fifth floors should remain intact, uh, remain in their uh, historic configuration. Our committee is, is also concerned about the color of the facade material. The applicant stated that the rendering uh, misrepresents the hue, uh, which is actually darker than what is pictured. Without samples and only the rendering in front of us, uh, the outcome is difficult to judge. It is important that the material closely match the original brownstone. Otherwise, when considered in combination with the proposed detailing, the design suggests a limestone rather than a brownstone building. Friends took no issue with the concept of adding a mansard uh, rooftop addition. However, the, the current proposal is highly utilitarian in appearance and lacks any true design. Moreover, the rooftop addition at the sixth floor is far too visible and much too large in combination with the mansard. The, application, the applicant should choose either a setback, non-visible rooftop addition, or a mansard addition, but not both. The changes to the rear yard are appropriate, and we applaud the applicant for keeping the rear window configuration suitable for a secondary elevation. The Preservation Committee at Friends asks the Commission to work with the applicant to make significant changes to the proposal as outlined above. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Herrera. <clears throat> Thanks, Alex Ferrer from the New York Landmark Conservancy. Uh, the Conservancy is opposed to the proposal. Um, we think it's a very poor preservation practice to ignore the authentic historic fabric in a building and to instead recreate uh, something else based on another building that has no association uh, with this building. W where they should be looking is directly next door to the twin building which was beautifully restored uh, just a few years ago. In fact, the Conservancy uh, gave the, <coughs> the, the partner building a Lucy Moses Award for the restoration, which is a beautiful restoration based on authentic details <coughs> of the building. So um, uh, we think it's impossible to ignore uh, the history uh, of this building and the one next door. Uh, the most correct approach to this would be to base alterations on um, uh, what was there and uh, on authentic details. Uh, to do otherwise, and as I said before, it just it does not fall into what we consider <coughs> any kind of correct approach in a historic district. Likewise, the use of limestone for the facade is totally alien to uh, the building. And we also think that the, the uh, rooftop addition is way too tall for uh, in this context, especially given the fact that the two neighboring buildings are uh, relatively modest in height. So overall, we think uh, the, this proposal needs a lot of, of uh, rethinking, and we hope that the commission can help the applicants in, do that. Thank you. Thank you. Marjorie Loeb. Good afternoon. I'm Margie, and I am the owner of 41 East 72nd Street, the sister structure to 39. And I am extremely concerned by the proposed project. Completed in 1882, our brownstones were some of the first built in the area and were among nine row houses on our block designated, designed by the architect Robert B. Lind. Today, they are the sole remnants of his neo brec work on East 72nd Street. As the applicant materials show, our brownstone's identities remained intertwined well into the 1940s. In fact, together, they survived the widespread architectural restyling of New York in the early 1900s. Such changes are now historic elements unto themselves and tell the story of our community's architectural evolution in the early, 1920, in the early 1900s. But that particular story has no relevance to 39 East 72nd Street. 
Unlike the applicants' examples of buildings altered around 1910, the project site was not restyled during that period. Adding a mansard roof and giving the structure a Beaux-Arts classical facelift now creates a false sense of the structure's history and completely changes the character of the building, its relation to my house, the twin building, the neighborhood, and the Upper East Side Historic District, which is part of. This is not to say that changes cannot and should not be done to 39 East 72nd Street, just because it is historic. I agree with the applicant that this structure in its current state could be improved. However, what they are proposing is not an improvement, but rather an unnecessary and unthoughtful design overhaul. Across the street is an excellent example at 40 East 72nd Street of a facade restoration and a rooftop addition. If standing at street level, the rooftop addition is clearly not visible. And it's actually between two very tall buildings, which is a point that was earlier made. According to that project, Certificate of Appropriateness, the addition was permitted based on the fact that, and I quote, the visibility of the roof, the proposed rooftop addition, will not cause it to call undue attention to itself or distract from the significant architectural features of the building or the surrounding streetscape because the addition has been designed with materials, finishes, and details which allow it to blend with the building's facades and with setbacks and amassing that allows it to be insubordinate to the two buildings on either side. As the applicant has demonstrated in their own redesign efforts, the intended two and a half story rooftop addition is not only highly visible from both East 72nd Street and across the street and Madison Avenue, but it does not blend with the structure it sits on top, nor its surroundings, including its neo grec twin. I'm I sorry your time is up. I'm sorry. I just urge you to work with the developer and come up with a suitable solution. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. David Parker? As the restoration architect of Mrs. Loeb's neighboring brownstone and an expert in architectural preservation, I share my client's trepidation over the proposed modifications to 3090 72nd Street and the ramifications they will have on the character of the historic structure, its twin, and surrounding community if approved. In short, the applicant is proposing the gratuitous transformation of an 1882 neo grec brownstone into a circa 1910 Beaux-Arts classical light sandstone mansion topped with a bulky and oblique two-story mansard-esque mass. Today, the, man, the, the brownstone retains all of its neo grec character-defining features, with the exception of its window uh, casings and stoop. It still has its all-important bracketed cornice, scored brownstone facade beneath later paint, and the proportion of its original vertical one-over-one one double-hung windows, including the original sash and glass. All of the features mentioned are part of the structure's 1981 landmarks designation, which explicitly discusses its neo grec style and historic significance as one of East 72nd Street's nine original brownstones. As the commission noted at the time it granted a certificate of appropriateness for the adjoining low residence, the surviving structures are a pair. If the applicant's proposal is approved, 39 East 72nd Street stands to lose all of its character-defining original landmark features to a design, with the exception of the cornice, to a design that is rooted in historically irrelevant and skewed research. Some of the proposed changes include filling in the lower court of the English basement, relocating the front entrance of the brownstone to the center of the building, which is uncharacteristic of a brownstone of this type, proportion, and period, changing the size and proportion of its masonry opening windows, although the original openings and sash survive, and replacing the entire brownstone facade to light sandstone, which destroys any suggestion that this building was historically a brownstone. In fact, as the applicant's materials show, the structure still had its brownstone face until the 1940s, after which point the original window casings were removed and the brownstone surface painted over. However, as can be seen in the applicant's probe two photos, the rest of the brownstone survives. Landmarks Preservation Commission Row House Manual explicitly states that, quote, only those sections of the exterior wall surfaces that have actually become unsound should be repaired or replaced. I would note that the brownstone facade of the adjoining Loeb house was easily restored, and the Loebs also, parenthetically, also restored the facade of their former west side brownstone, which had been covered with paint for over 50 years. 
In addition to the aforementioned unsympathetic street-facing changes, the applicant's proposal also requires improper alterations to the rear facade. According to the applicant's drawings, original decorative parapet brickwork would be ignored and or removed in order to eliminate the angled offset of the existing sixth floor wing. The row house manual notes that alterations to original rooftop elements that will change the appearance of a historic building are, quote, discouraged. And I hope the commission will continue to discourage the destruction of historic details by denying the applicant's proposed modifications to the rear facade. Thank you. Thank you. John Wasilewski. Hi, I'm John Wasilewski. As one of the restoration architects who worked on the adjacent property at 41 East 72nd Street, I'm here to uh, speak out against the proposed project at 39 East 72nd for several reasons. At the front of the building on 72nd Street, it's important to note that all of the existing window openings uh, from the parlor level and above are their original size and proportion, matching the windows openings of the adjacent property at number 41. Looking closely at the photos of the existing conditions, you can see all of the shadows of the original window encasements. The current proposal inexplic inexplicably alters the sizes and proportion of the windows on floor floors of the building. The argument that it is necessary in order to provide street level accessibility fails to consider the utilization of an accessible ramp down to a lower level, which would allow for the preservation of window openings on the facade from the parlor level and above. At the rear of the building, I would like to draw your attention to original de the original decorative brick cornice. The proposed current proposal would either remove or conceal a good portion of this cornice by filling uh, the open inset wedge at the rear wing. Also, the articulation of the two and a half story addition at the rear of the building is proposed to be flush to the surface of and also undistinguished from the surface of the brick wall below. By doing so, this proposal severely obscures the original form of the building from the rear yard. I would note that the adjacent property at 41 East 72nd Street was held to a higher standard by which they were not allowed to remove or conceal any of the existing brick cornice and the relatively modest rooftop addition at that property was mandated to be set back one foot from the bearing wall below so as to preserve the original geometry of the building at the rear yard. For all of these reasons, I ask that you uh, consider um, denying and working with the developer to rethink their proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more speakers on this item? All right, Community Board 8 has uh, submitted their resolution and they recommend disapproval of this project. Yes, disapproval. Okay. Yes, you'd like to respond? Thanks. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to address some of the comments that were made, but particularly to sort of focus on uh, this image as a sort of a general um, starting off point. I think one of the issues that we need to remember is that other than the cornice, the sort of neo greek character of this building has largely been lost. Um, the designation report, while it certainly didn't give it a no-style designation, it just says some neo greek details. And our intention, obviously, is to preserve those details and the details, um, particularly the ironwork, at the base of the building. So I think this sort of reference to sort of destroying some of the original detailing, I think it's important to understand sort of what the starting point is. And granted, in 1882, it was a very richly detailed neo greek facade, but this is where we start our project today. When you say this, is the brownstone under the white paint, in your professional opinion, restorable? It looks like it has a skin coat over the brownstone, and basically between the paint and the brownstone. Uh, we haven't stripped paint, we haven't done paint stripping, but it appears that there's something cementitious gray. Um, I think we have photographs um, that may be in the set um, but we did, we did look because that was something we wanted to be able to answer. So you're, you're, you're saying that your opinion is that if there is in fact a, a skim on there that it would not be restorable, you would not be able if to If there's something cementitious it. on the brownstone, no. It, brownstone to begin with is a pretty, um, it's a very soft material. So to get that off, you'd be taking away sure. material. Okay. Um, so I think, I think understanding sort of what the starting point is very relevant in this. And I think the design proposal while it, this is certainly not a restoration, we wouldn't be in front of you if this was a restoration. This is we're here at a public hearing seeking a certificate of appropriateness because there is some change in addition to the facade, obviously the roof. 
The restorative work at the building next door, 41 East 72nd Street, entirely is, is very commendable and is done at a very high level. But we, our starting point was something very different. So we have a building that has largely been stripped. And I think um, that allows, um, or, or allows us to accommodate uh, more change to the facade. Um, the choice was made not to restore all of the detailing uh, that is adjacent. I think this building has been through a lot. It, there are other changes that we need to make in terms of accessibility, and that then dictates certain other changes. And we looked at the district and saw the way these buildings changed over time. And our effort um, was to sort of come up with a facade design that accounts for that, that sort of integrates some differing stylistic treatments, something that's a bit more classical at the base, um, which is something that you see throughout the district, and sort of more of the neo brick detailing with the incised detail on the stone on the upper floors. This is not a Beaux-Arts mansion. Our client wanted to do that at the outset and basically start again with a limestone facade. That's not what this is. This is sandstone. It's a true stone material, and we think it's actually sort of a creative, uh, a creative use of the material in its relationship with the brownstone uh, next door. Um, finally, I just want to sort of note, particularly in this view, this notion of visibility versus appropriateness. Um, the mansard is visible. It's designed to be visible. Historically, they were designed to be visible. We can't make this mansard be a mansard and push it 50 feet back. So I think the idea here is, again, as I said before, the idea of how did these buildings sort of grow historically, sort of putting this in a historic context. <coughs> these buildings often, and the owners that, that own them, saw as a way to enlarge the, the area of these buildings, we put an addition on the roof with a mansard front. And that's basically the direction that we thought was most uh, appropriate for uh, for this project. All right. Uh, questions for the applicant? Any questions? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, um, Michael. Does this, this building is now a multiple dwelling. That's correct. It is staying a multiple dwelling. Why do you, do you need to upgrade the handicap code, or is that something you're choosing to do? No, it's a, it's a requirement because we are, we're, we're doing enough work on the interior that, uh, that we have to raise the standard is, has been raised. Right, but in order to, it seems like a little bit of a catch-22 because in order to meet the handicap accessibility requirements, you're doing a lot of intervention within the building, in interior, and therefore you have to put it in. But if you didn't do so much intervention, you may not have to put it in. So if you, in other words, if you weren't changing any of the floors, would you need to do it? Yes, still. We're, we're, we're upgrading all of the building systems on the interior. So all the plumbing is being upgraded. All the bathrooms are being made accessible. Okay. You know, we are, it's not a single family residence. It's a multiple dwelling. So as such, it requires compliance. And there are, you know, to your point, there are, there are some uh, <coughs> vague, uh, you know, parts of this code, but uh, we are taking, we're taking the approach which we feel is the most appropriate and will, will result in the most success. All right. Uh, then um, I would suggest that you think about the arguments that you made to us about the first two floors being altered, but retaining some of the historic fenestration that you have above the third floor. I was just looking at your... Um, floor to ceiling heights and it seems within that height you can you don't have to shift every floor and I think that at least then there's some you're retaining more of the fabric than you're retaining right now because otherwise it seems like you're I'm not sure what you really are retaining because it, it's except for one row of windows they're all shifting everything's shifting so all the floors have shifted don't you think it's the it's actually the parlor height uh, window and floor that's that's would will be the most significant loss. Uh, I mean, rather than the you know few inches on the top floors, it's it's really this parlor height that um, that shifts shifts it away from its from the partner from the next door building and away from the Neo Greek <coughs> proportioning system. Do you, it's, uh, can you respond to that about just, um, you know, whether, do you see is, most of these have a parlor floor and therefore you have to go well, at a lower level? It depends on how these buildings were altered over time. I mean, okay. it's something, let's just look at a few of these, um, you know, these examples. So, Because um, some of them seem to be. Know, some of these buildings, the, the, you know, this, these were built as a row, so presumably <clears> they have <throat> continuous floors. These actually have differing window heights. 
um, in in their altered uh, in their altered state. So um, and you know windows at the third floor here were widened and say sort of the fenestration sort of changes significantly, really based on personal taste, uh, because all of these were done really by individual owners following this sort of original sort of consistent treatment. So um, these other examples, you know. You don't have as much of a, a um, similarity, but you can uh, from side to side. But here, the cast, the cast, many of these changes were made before this, there was a landmark's permission to protect buildings from these kinds of changes. <coughs> well, we obviously were, you know, this has happened, you know, almost uh, a century before. But I think one of the things that we've looked at, similar to the Mansard, is is sort of how did things change historically? And we're sort of thinking about that in that context. Is this something, are we, are we proposing something that um, is completely foreign to the district, or is this something that one sees in the district? This is sort of the palette that we're looking at. And so this, this is what we draw from. We, you know, we are not going back to a high stoop brownstone. We have a multiple, multiple dwelling, and that's the existing condition of what our, our proposal is. So then in that context, uh, and looking at how much this building has already absorbed in terms of change, particularly the facade, are these things similar to what you see elsewhere in the district? And that's sort of how we've... Right, but just going back to that point, some of the changes that you've seen where, in fact, you just can walk uh, off at grade, are those modern interventions or were there those alterations that were made historically as, like, the mansard? Um, you know, we didn't look at all, we looked more at the centering um, okay. versus, versus the grade. I mean, I think John, John right. spoke to the code thing. I mean, I'll just say, I think responsibly, the thing to do is to have an at-grade entry. Um, the areaway is very small, and I, I don't know that you can actually fit a ramp. It's a question for John to answer. It's, it's, the, the, the difference in grade is about 30 inches. That would require a 30-foot ramp. There's no way. You just can't fit yeah, it. I think a lift. The only alternative is to have a lift. You know, and, and to design an enclosure for a lift that would go into the court, into that, into that space. So, I mean, I think you know, the design solution that that it, that's shown, I think, is actually pretty sensitive. Uh, but, but obviously, this is <laughs> this is to, uh, open to inter interpretation. As I said, John can address the code, but I think this is sort of a, a responsible thing to do to provide accessibility for for the new tenants uh, of the building. And I don't think. Um, particularly at the ground floor, I don't think it interrupts, um, and the scale of this ground floor in particular, it doesn't feel like it interrupts um, the overall reading of the facade. Uh, I think this datum that John was speaking to at the second floor does create this distinction of a, uh, a new base um, and then the uh, sort of more regular <coughs> upper floors. I, I have another question, maybe to, to Michael and Fred especially. Can you do, go back to the, uh, the existing facade? Uh, and I don't know if this is more of a departure or less from the original. I mean, the idea of dropping down the parlor window to windows to become to come to ground level, uh, really making them tall. Now, that's 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 really no style, I suppose. Um, and it's losing you a floor, ish. Uh, is that does that do anything? You're saying to take these windows and to bring. I think proportionally you end up with something that's yeah. uh, a bit awkward. Is it? It's too bizarre, yes? Okay. <laughs> I think it would be somewhat bizarre. Um, all right, just so why don't we focus on the facade right now, and then we can go to the, uh, the, um, the additions. Michael, do you have any uh, comments on, on like, the material and the... Well, only that... Um, is that a Casota stone that you're using, <coughs> or an Ohio, uh, the buff? Sandstone. I know it would be unusual to see that on a residence in New York City in 1882. Yeah. So it's a contextual. I, th I think that if I could just interject, I think this isn't an 1882 row house. This is a 19 teens row house. So I think you know we actually did find light colored sandstone, uh, which was which was an up. Obviously, it's an upgrade from the brownstone. You see, obviously, you see a lot of brownstone from the 18. 1880s, 1870s, but the date of this building, I think we're thinking about more is sort of in the in the sort of first quarter of the 20th century. And, and just okay. one thing, this is an Ohio standstone. Okay. Uh, all right. Other uh, comments? Yes, uh, Michael. I, mean, I think that I mean a lot. Of, this raises a lot of issues that we've seen in, in other locations. And I think for me, it go, the, the first way that I grapple with it is to try to understand what 
the approach is that the applicant is making. And it seems to me like the approach is, here we have a facade that if in fact we all agree that the brownstone is, for all intents and purposes, effaced uh, from, you know, and it cannot be restored, then what we have here is a basically denuded facade that has, uh, so, so whatever we do, it's going to be a reconstruction, not a restoration. I mean, there's, well, all that you've got left is the, the, the substructure and the window openings, which I think is not nothing, but it's not very much. Um, so no matter what we do, we're recreating in almost whole cloth, with the exception of the cornice, we are recreating the visible facade. Um, uh, now, and then what we're doing, well, then the, the second step, is, so, so given that it's a recreation, the recreation is meant to tell a story. And the story it, that they're trying to tell is, we have the old building on the upper two floors, and on the lower two floors there was one of those 19, 19 teens, 1920s Andrew Dolcart renovations, where, where there was a, uh, you know, and that's what the, the, the examples were of. Those were of that period where there was a change in style, and, and the, 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 the brownstone, the, the stoops were stripped off, the, center, the entries were put on grade, et cetera, et cetera. That's the, that's the narrative that this is trying, the fiction that this is trying to put forth. And I think that's a reasonable fiction, or as reasonable as any other. If, if I may, and I think Cass is probably right, at the point at which this facade renovation took place, they would have, they would have put an application of Portland cement on this. And that is absolutely the kiss of death for brownstone. They'll never get it off without destroying at least another three quarters or a half an inch of, of the remaining brownstone. Okay, so your feeling is that in fact uh, what he's saying is oh, correct. Absolutely. But, so okay. if that's the case, mm -hmm. <clears throat> then I think that the, the story that they're trying to tell has to be told better. And I would say that that should be done in the following ways. First of all, the top two floors should be as much as possible reconstruction. If that's what they're going to make the argument as, all right. We've seen an example here of, of, other, of other materials being used in lieu of brownstone that does a better job of recreating brownstone than, than the sandstone does. And if these were kind of uh, highlighted within the, the, uh, the uh, designation report as twins, I think that reasonable effort should be made to try to make them as twinny as possible, at least on the upper two floors. The examples that Cass showed, even with, lowered, with lower levels that were varied, were seen to be twins in Cass's recitation by virtue of the upper floors being relatively identical. So I think that greater effort should be made to make the upper floors identical, aligning the, aligning the sills precisely, trying to get the material to be identical. We saw one that was pretty interesting with terracotta. There, I'm sure there are other, you know, there's the cementitious option. There are lots of other options that one could use that would make a better uh, match and then I think on the lower level, the, 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 the fiction of the 1920s renovation, I can, I can accept that because it is, uh, it is a reconstruction of something that's not there. We're not restoring this house to its original status. It's not a restoration. It's a reconstruction. Um, that said, I think the proportions are a bit peculiar and could be restudied to make it a better version of what it aspires to be. I'll, st I'll stop there. Uh, yeah, Roberta? Um. <clears throat> said in terms of uh, where we are, what they're starting with in terms of the facade. But I think uh, another gesture towards um, saying that you are one of the twin is maybe, if possible, to put the entrance on the same side, to let it be where it was, rather than having to center it, which I think maybe uh, makes it a twin of something somewhere else, but um, doesn't really do anything for its neighbor. And also the, the railing type, um, I would think that uh, it should be um, less like a, a fence and more like a railing, um, as they showed in some other examples, I think. Um, so I mean, I, I think that um, I agree that yes, it, it is a twin, but it's a long time uh, past that point and a lot of things are lost. Uh, but I guess I think there's symbolically some things that could still be including the top two floors um, in terms of where the windows are located and maybe something at the bottom more symbolic. But I accept that, yes, you could have a, a walk off the street um, accessible entrance. Okay, yes, I do you want to say? Yeah, I, for some reason I have um, 
photographed this building uh, many times walking in the city. And in part, it has to do with the fact that it's white and that the cornice makes this amazing shadow on the facade. And not to romanticize that too much, but I found it. I've always found it beautiful in part, in great part because of the proportion of these windows in the way that they live on the facade, the height and the thinness of the, of the parlor window, and, uh, uh, and, and reading the cornice as a kind of a truly uh, remaining, strong remaining piece. And we were talking about Drayton Hall earlier. I, I realize that this is not a great example. Uh, but you know what it really means to, to, to let something be what it, what it, what it was Oh, at some point, you know, I mean, we really are changing it. You'd be changing it dramatically. And so if we accept that you're changing it dramatically, then, then fine. But it is a, a very big change. Uh, you know, it's not, a, it's not an individual designation, designated building, so. Right. All right. Um, let's go to the... We'll wrap up on these, you know, we'll try and conclude the comments on the facade, but why don't we also talk about the rooftop addition? And um, I think for me, I, I think the mansard uh, seems appropriate. I think, at least in my mind, they've convinced me that uh, that it's historically been done. And I agree, it's worthwhile to say that if you're putting a mansard, that's where you would place it, and it will be visible. And we've allowed mansards in other neighborhoods uh, which have historically had some mansards. Uh, I think that the, uh, the mezzanine, and I think that's troubling because it's, it does, uh, I, I think, change the profile of buildings in the neighborhood, and it's visible, even if it's for a short area. I think very often you'll find yourself there and staring at it, everybody doesn't pass by. And it seems either you want to set it back and try and align itself to some other things that are there on the rooftop so it gets hidden, or you should think about, uh, I don't know, reducing the height um, or eliminating, you know, eliminating it altogether. I, you just, I, I think it should be restudied uh, completely. I, so uh, do others feel similarly on that front? Okay, so I think that really needs to be restudied. Look at some other options, see how you could do it. Otherwise, you should consider possibly, you know, if it's requiring a huge redesign, which is changing where your core is and all your stairs are, then either you do that to reduce the visibility or you think about eliminating it. So in terms of uh, the facade itself, um, I mean, there are various opinions over here on that one, but I think it seems, if I can sum up, I think there's a, a generally, I think the commission may accept uh, the treatment uh, at the lower levels. That's what I've gathered in the first two floors. Those alterations take place. Uh, I think there, in general, the commission would like to see more of, I think, the historic fenestration to remain. The treatment of how you want, if you want to keep it simple, you've chosen to do, I don't know if it's exactly a twin building, but, um, but chosen to use a lot of the elements and make it relate to that, uh, but then you haven't done that, that fully. And uh, I mean, I agree with you, there's something nice to the simplicity of just uh, the white and the, you know, the, the cornice. However, you've chosen to proceed in this direction, and I think that's fine too, but it seems to be, it needs some resolution. It's not there as yet. And I think you should look at the proportions again and see how much you can keep, retain it. I don't have any comments about the material uh, per se, uh, because it is a new cladding. I, and. I think there's an agreement or an understanding that the brownstone cannot be brought back, but are looking for material that is, uh, I mean, any comments on the material again? No. Okay. All right. I, okay, so any other comments that I've missed that we'd like to put back on the record? All right. Thank you. So we, we'll wait for you to come back then. We'll close the hearing.